I'm Bob Crinchley, and this is 3Com Park, home of the San Francisco Giants. It's the last game of the regular season, and the Giants have already clinched the National League West Championship. They used to call this Candlestick Park, but now it's named for 3Com, a company that made its millions by plumbing the Internet. Now, thanks to the growth of cyberspace, their bits and bytes have bought them the best bats and balls. This series is all about the internet and the wired world and about the geeks and nerds who largely by accident invented it, making billions and billions of dollars along the way. And that's all it takes to put your name on a ballpark. Wiring the world has launched an information revolution. It's changing the way we live and work, and the pace is awesome. Four years ago, three million people used the internet. Today, it's a hundred million. By the year 2005, it could be a billion. Even if you don't own a PC, have never gone online, and think a website has something to do with spiders, the internet is transforming your world. And if you don't believe it, just look what's already happening. Well, you've heard about the information age. It's here, it's the internet, it's the web, it's happening right in front of us. It's, it's a privilege to be here watching it happen because I've been worrying about it for decades. The internet boom hasn't even started. I mean, people are all, you know, geeked up about it, but we're just beginning to scratch. I think we're in the roaring 20s. For the true believers, the internet is much more than an electronic novelty. They have adopted a web lifestyle. The cheerleaders of this new revolution are staking their companies on all of us following their lead. You're living a web lifestyle when you just take it for granted that any purchase you make, any new thing you want to plan like a trip, you turn to the web as part of that process. Uh, people today live a phone lifestyle and a car lifestyle. And they almost laugh when you say that to them because it's just so taken for granted. A web lifestyle means living in the fast lane where time seems as compressed as the data in the wires and change is the only constant. Take this building south of Market Street in San Francisco. Five years ago it was mostly derelict. Now it's been colonized by young internet entrepreneurs. But for how long? Aha! <laughs> Things have changed. Hey. By the time this show airs, this San Francisco neighborhood will no longer be the hippest and hottest place in the digital world. That's because in the wired world, products and fashions change at warp speed. Time, time is measured in dog years. I'm physically 35, and um, my last year was a full net year, which is about seven regular years, about, it's about a dog year, right? Yeah. So that means that, you know, 35 plus seven, so I'm virtually 42, right? So basically, since I kind of feel 42, since I live so hard, I may as well have my midlife crisis and get it all over with, right? Buying a motorcycle, right? Date a young guy. In internet time, there are no secrets, there's no time for delay, there are plenty of competitors who are gonna eat you alive. You need to not take a breath and start over and do it again as soon as you get done the, you know, with one, and you need to juggle three or four of these all the time. That's how you compete and survive if you're in the software business uh, on the internet. In the web universe, the person with two years experience has gotten more experience in web years than uh, someone who's got 20 years of the previous generation of programming. It's a bit of an overstatement, but um, web years, you know, are a wonderful curiosity to the general public and an uh, actual health threat to those who work in the industry. Well, I've been in the net for three years, and mm -hmm. three years ago I was 41, so 41 and 21 makes me 62. You're a senior citizen. <sighs> <laughs> Hi, 
Today's kids are growing up wired. The information revolution is just part of everyday life. 70% of American schools now have access to the internet. Take Edwin Chu. I first met him in 1995. Even then, he knew exactly where he was headed. What do your friends think of you? Boy, he's a nerd. Yeah, but I don't mind. I'm used to being called a nerd. Can't have other people stop your dreams. Hey, Edwin. Hi. Hey, so. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. Edwin is an inventor. He's made a laser pointer from a dental floss box, and he's designed the go-ped. It's a combination of a go-kart and a moped, because a moped has two wheels, and a go-kart's got four, and this one's got three, and it's right in the middle. And <laughs> have it, it's a go-ped. Go-ped. The front end of this looks like uh, some sort of... Uh, that, was, that was my sister's old tricycle. She never used it. I made it into something actually useful. Edwin was born in 1985 in the PC generation. His talent for technology may make him a future entrepreneur, but otherwise he's a typical American teenager. His world is being shaped by the internet and the web at a pace you have to experience to believe. Yep, this thing's fully charged and ready to go. He's left me in his dust. Yo, Edwin, he's gone, he's gone. Nothing illustrates the incredible rate of change in the internet better than the story of six young guys I first met with four years ago in that garage. Straight out of Stanford University, they started a company then called Architects, and I've been coming back every year to watch them grow. And have they grown? The company, now called Excite, is worth more than a billion dollars. Let's flash back to that first meeting in 1994. It's hard to look beyond. We need a demo, and we need it now. Usually at the core, there's, there's, there's one guy with you know, minimal social skills, but just amazing <laughs> yeah, brain. Yeah, we got one. He, we have he's one got, here? Uh, <laughs> he has great oh, yeah. social skills. Oh, he has great so. social skills. <laughs> here you are. Well, how's it going? It's going great. How is it, how is it like working with these semi-incompetents? <laughs> they're, they're all quite competent, <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. How much so far has this all cost? Two thousand dollars, maybe. Yeah. You still have money in the bank. Oh yeah, yeah. We're frugal. We're really frugal. <laughs> it's amazing. That's why the rice. That's the rice. That's the rice. That's exactly. the rice. Exactly. I'll return to the architects' boys to see how they get on, but already they were smart enough to see that information technology was going to be a big business. The PC was the largest single legal creation of wealth we've ever seen on the planet. So. I figure right now we're into year three of the web, and by my calculation, the new companies, not the existing ones, but the new web companies, are worth more than $40 billion. And that's uh, four times what the PC companies were worth at this point in the decade of the PC. This is not a hula hoop, it's not a fad. Hey, aren't the experts saying that very few internet businesses are profitable? Well, that's true right now. But in cyberspace, these are pioneer days, and the land rush has just begun. Still, there are a few early stakeholders who have already hit pay dirt. Maybe it was inevitable that the first moneymaker on the internet would be sex. After all, that's what got movies and videos started. Welcome to the Peep Show for the Information Age, a new take on an old trick. Nowadays, thanks to the interactive assets of the Internet, you can see exactly what you want, or more accurately, what you pay $5.99 a minute for. So, Kat, you're part of the, uh, the adult uh, Internet industry. Yes, I do, am. Do you feel like a pioneer? Uh, yes, actually, I like this new venue. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm getting a fresh start like right at the beginning of it, and there's a lot of open doors. On the web, you can't handle the merchandise, but that hasn't prevented the greatest of all American inventions, shopping, from entering cyberspace. No surprise to find that the World Wide Web has become a virtual mall. One of the first virtual stores to build a real business is a virtual bookstore.
This is Amazon.com, the brainchild of Jeff Bezos. He figured out that books were the ideal internet product because you don't need to touch before you buy. So Jeff rented a giant warehouse in Seattle, hired a bunch of Generation X bibliophiles, and ships the books which customers order from Amazon's website. So far, Amazon hasn't made a profit, but it's valued at more than a billion dollars. Clearly, a lot of investors think Jeff's internet idea is hot. There's a sort of a fundamental irony that we're using bits to sell atoms. And yeah, it's, it's a little wacky. But it works, and it's extremely efficient, and people recognize the value. A year after we visited the architects' boys in their grungy garage, they'd gone through the VC experience and moved into a real office. The boys were a year older and five years wiser. Working 100 hours a week can do that to you. The venture capitalist who backed the architect's dream was Vinod Koshla. Now, what made me spend five or $10,000 on 15 minutes on five guys, or really two guys, so, Joe Krause uh, and Graham free Spencer, free who I was meeting for the first time, who had never had a job, never had any success, had completely crazy notions of what applications they wanted to pursue. There was something about them that said to me, they are good entrepreneurs. They were good listeners. They were good debaters. They were thoughtful about my comments. They didn't give in to everything I said. They didn't disagree with everything I said. And I really liked the vibrations, the wipes. They were really good wipes. These are the five sentences that are statistically most relevant to the document. A moat it is to trouble the mind's eye. That's pretty deep. <laughs> Let's leave Graham for the moment. That, that is, that Summarizing is, Shakespeare has its uses, but the web has a lot more to offer, like replacing the post office and the telephone. The web is incredibly exciting because it is the, the fulfillment of a lot of our dreams that the computer would ultimately not be primarily a device for computation, but metamorphosize into a device for communication. And the, with the web, that's finally happening. Um, and secondly, it's exciting because Microsoft doesn't own it, and therefore there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening. Welcome. You've got mail. And the tool for communication is email, baby. That's number one. I must get, you know, I probably get 100 pieces of email a day. But at least 30 of them nowadays come from outside. They come from, hey, but I haven't seen you since you and I were in school together in fifth grade in Belgium. Do you remember me? <laughs> Dear Steve, life's a beach. Wish you were here. <laughs> I'm sending an email to Steve Ballmer, who obviously likes receiving them. This will be one of the 100 million email messages that go out over the internet today. Email is the information revolution up close and personal. For more and more people, it's the way to communicate. You can send everything that you would put in a telephone conversation or a letter, and usually do it faster, cheaper, and it's global. There, that saves a postcard. Thanks to email and computer bulletin boards, the internet has created virtual communities, far-flung groups of people with a shared interest. Boston writer Fawn Fitter joined The Well, one of the oldest electronic meeting places where she has met, talked, and argued with kindred souls and even fallen in love. I had this computer and I went out and bought this modem and I got online. And I was just blown away, absolutely. Because I realized that here was this literally community of, you know, at the time probably about 5,000 people who were not just talking about sex or trying to pick each other up or whatever, um, that they were having actual conversations about actual things that I was interested in. I will confess that when I first got online, I had a little cyber fling and um, the thing about online romances is that because you aren't actually with the person, you can project anything you want onto them. And then when reality slaps you in the face, it can either be a real wake-up call or it can work out wonderfully. I was just blown away by the style and fluency of this person's written communications. 
And then when we met in person, it just became apparent that he wasn't quite as fluent with emotional interchange. I'm not slamming him. He's a good guy. It's, he's just not the one for me. And I don't think of having met him online as being all that very different from having met him at a party or in a bar or through a personal zat or just rollerblading down the sidewalk. Back to those architects guys. When I caught up with them again in 1997, what a transformation. They changed the name of the company to Excite, moved to a bigger office, and had even done some cool TV advertising. If you can just get your mind together, then come on across to me. They used their venture funding to recruit a real CEO what in the Valley we call adult supervision. So it's a very odd situation you know, when you come into, the, into a, a deal where you're interviewing with a 24-year-old or a 23-year-old guy at the time and trying to sort of puff your chest out about all the things you've accomplished and all you've done. And here's a 23-year-old guy who's sort of well on his way to being a millionaire or a multiple millionaire um, and who's got a very good view of business already at the age of 23. And he was not alone among the other founders. They also were very sophisticated in other ways. Most important of all, the company had gone public. After just three years, each of these 20-somethings was worth about $10 million and had money to spend. Bought a new phone. Bought a new phone. StarTac phone, I love that phone. Uh, and I've bought a camera. This is sort of my other new toy, which is uh, just small. Take pictures, try to take one picture a day in my life and record it. Um, a phone, a, a camera, that's it? Didn't you buy like a, a car? A car? I bought a car. I heard you bought a house. I, just yesterday, that's right. <laughs> what a big step. That's grown Huge up. step. That's very grown up. I had a hard time making a decision because I wanted to get, I wasn't going for a luxury mobile. I wasn't going for a Porsche or anything like that. But I wanted a pretty nice car. And I wanted lots of gadgets. I like gadgets in my cars. But the problem was that I'm also vegetarian, so I didn't want leather seats in my car. And so uh, what I discovered as I was shopping for cars was that there are almost no car manufacturers who put all the gadgets in a version of their car without leather seats. So you can either have leather seats and gadgets or no leather seats and no gadgets. And so it was a big dilemma for me to try to pick the right vehicle that had the features I wanted and the seats that I wanted. So you get rich and you get a white Volkswagen. Right, isn't this nice? I figured it's sort of the retro thing. Round headlights, trunk in front, good four cylinders. I'm really sort of jealous of this car though. Yeah? A friend of mine bought this one. Yeah, don't nice, give me that. Nice BMW Don't give M3. me that, this is yours, Ooh, isn't it? Tree sap. It is. It is. It's a fun little car. So when Cars, phones, this, houses, just some of the rewards uh, for the young the geek smart enough to exploit no, the world's latest so revolution. The revolution being created by the internet is different from all previous ones. It's abolishing distance. This is my garage. A few years ago, I'd get in my car here and drive to the office. But today, thanks to the internet, it is my office. In fact, it's the headquarters for my intergalactic business empire. With my computer plugged into the internet, I run two software companies, write my column for PBS, and attempt to manage my life. It's a revolution, all right, and you know what? We owe it all to the Russians. The race to the new frontier, outer space, was the new sensation of 1957. Up through the fast thinning atmosphere that climb into the space void, from the desolate it began with Sputnik, the satellite launched by the USSR in 1957. Sputnik caused a worldwide sensation and sent shockwaves through the U.S. administration. It forced two presidents into action. Their separate initiatives both paid off years later in 1969. President Eisenhower created an agency called ARPA to fund high-powered scientific and space research. Being an army man, he made the Pentagon responsible. So, obscure academics suddenly found themselves on the Cold War's front line. The money we spend yearly without putting a single weapon in our arsenal is $5 billion, $200 million. It created a considerable stir. It was clear that the area that we had chosen to work in 
uh, was going to get more attention. And science, for a long time before that, had not had a particularly good name. It had not been a big deal. And I think there was a sudden realization that it maybe was important after all. All pre-start panel lights are correct. The ready light is on. President Kennedy's challenge to the Russians was to commit America to putting a man on the moon. He gave that project to NASA, the civilian agency. By now, it had taken over from the Pentagon responsibility for space research. Godspeed, John Glenn. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. As NASA launched America's first astronauts, Pentagon scientists decided computers had the right stuff. Compared with the high-profile moon missions, computer research was something of a Cinderella. Throughout the 1960s, it was the space race which got all the media's attention. The computers of the 60s were the size of small apartments. Their use was strictly rationed and only a few people got anywhere near them. Still, a visionary psychologist at MIT, J.C.R. Licklider, known to all as Lick, saw their growing potential. The computer technology has been moving in a way that nothing else people have ever known has moved. Here's a field that gets a thousand times as good in 20 years. Lick had this concept of the intergalactic network, which he uh, believed was uh, that everybody could use computers anywhere and get out data anywhere in the world. Specialized hardware facilities tend to be expensive, but very efficient. On the other hand, if they can be distributed, then specialized hardware facilities can be very effective and can let us do things that we couldn't otherwise do. Lick was thinking big about the future of networking at a time when there was only a handful of computers anywhere in the world, and decades before the personal computer would arrive. The vision was really Lick's, in the, in the, in the originally. I mean, any, none of us can really claim to have seen that before him, nor anybody in the world. I mean, Lick saw this vision in, in the early 60s. He didn't have, have a clue as how to build it. You know, <laughs> he didn't have any idea what to do to make this happen. By the mid-60s, the Gemini program was regularly sending American astronauts into orbit. On Earth, ARPA was funding mainframe computers for research at major universities. Mainframes were too big and expensive for personal use. But in keeping with the communal spirit of the times, a system was devised to provide more people with computer access. It had the science fiction name, Time Sharing. Many users were connected to the same computer, and the user had the illusion in any, other, every individual user had the illusion that the computer was just serving that user. Mm -hmm. The computer was fast enough so it could serve you and move to the next person and the next person and the next person and come back to you and you didn't ever, uh, you were never aware of the fact that it left you. The internet and the World Wide Web were really born right here at the U.S. Pentagon, headquarters for the world's most powerful fighting force and home with the squarest jaws on the planet. A sack full of money was set aside to fund far-out scientific research as part of the so-called space race. Like most Pentagon projects, it had a strange acronym, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. But DARPA had very little to do with defense and a great deal to do with the research interests of the people who controlled the money. As NASA achieved the first docking in space, Bob Taylor took over ARPA's responsibility for spending the Pentagon's budget for computer research. In most government funding, there are committees that decide who gets <clears throat> what and who does what. And uh, in ARPA, we, that was not the way it worked. The person who was responsible for the office that was concerned with that particular technology, in my case, computer technology, was the person who made the decision about what to fund and what to do and what not to do. So um, the decision to start the ARPANET was mine, you know, with very little or no red tape. It's more than 30 years since Taylor worked in the endless, nondescript halls of the Pentagon. And do you know, they have a speed limit in these corridors. A long way from Silicon Valley, light years from the Silicon Valley way of doing business, the campaign to build a national computer network began here. 
for going to what was Bob Taylor's office where the word went out to start wiring the world. Oh. <laughs> Hello? Hi. Hi, Bob Crinchley. Jim McKinney. Okay, Jim, do you know that the internet was uh, invented, was founded right in this room? Uh, no, I did not. Well, you haven't redecorated either, as I can see. <laughs> so do you use the internet in your work? Uh, we certainly do. Is it it doesn't look to? like much, but here stuff. Bob Taylor had a brainwave. How about networking all of ARPA's computers together? So he asked his boss, Charlie Hertzfeld, for a million dollars. And he got it. Can I get a job here? I was sitting uh, in the, my office in the Pentagon, and to communicate with people at Santa Monica, I had to move to sit down at this terminal here. And if I wanted to talk with the people in, or the computer in Berkeley, I had to get up from this terminal and go over and sit at another terminal, go through a different protocol, a different command language. The same for MIT. So it's, the obvious question is, wait a minute. Why don't we have one terminal and have all of these places interconnected? It might not be an intergalactic network, but even interstate would be a huge step. The universities ARPA funded weren't enthusiastic about the so-called ARPANET. But many of the uh, people in charge of the computing facilities at these ARPA-supported places saw uh, the uh, ARPANET as a threat in the sense that it meant that someone from another part of the country would be using some of your precious computer time. The typical response was, why? I say, well, look, you, you know, you'll be part of a network, and you can use other people's networks, and they can use your, other people's computers, you can, and they can use yours. I say, no, nobody can use mine. It's overloaded right, 100% right now. Don't touch me. Initially, some of the universities that had these host sites weren't incredibly enthusiastic. I mean, they would say, why do I want to else use my computer? I'm busy enough right here. Oh, I, I don't want to share anything with that other guy's site anyway. We've got our own, uh, you know, uh, uh, fish to fry. People were totally unwilling to do it. However, each of these sites was being supported, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars a year by ARPA, and ARPA said, you're going to join this network. And sure enough, they did. In 1968, the Apollo program succeeded Gemini and lunar missions began. Meanwhile, Bob Taylor was pushing his plan to link ARPA-funded mainframes at UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, and Stanford in California and the University of Utah. So ARPA issued a request for quotations to 140 technology companies. The brief was to invent the first ever digital computer network. Time for the Cringely Crash Course in Geek. That's modern geek, not ancient. Every revolution brings its own specialist vocabulary. I bet Alexander Graham Bell spent entire dinner parties explaining dial-a-joke. Well, the information revolution is no exception. It's brought whole new meaning to words like digital, packet, protocol, and browser. The key word is digital, and we can blame computers for that one. A computer is just a box of switches, and switches are either off or on, represented by the numbers 0 and 1. Any information, no matter how long or complicated, coming from a computer can be represented by a string of those two digits, 0 and 1. That's why we call the process digital. It's not very original, but then computers aren't known for their imagination. Larry Roberts was chosen to draw up the request for quotations. He was an MIT computer scientist who became the chief architect of the ARPANET. Let's pause to consider the social habits of 1960s geeks like Larry and his friend and colleague, Len Kleinrock. These guys are applied mathematicians, and for fun and profit, they applied their mathematics to gambling. You're a gambler. I, I do when I can win, when I know how to win. Do you know how to win? Well, at gambling, yes. I, I know how to count. Larry and I always liked puzzles, and we liked challenges. And of course, Las Vegas presented a wonderful challenge. We were going after roulette. See, roulette is a wonderful game. It, it, it's a game where you lose a nickel on every dollar you bet, by and large, if it's fair. So we developed a system to just measure where the ball and the wheel were, 
calculate when it's going to fall in. And just, you just have to predict half the wheel, and you've got two to one odds in your favor. But we needed some data. And so I wanted to record the sound of the wheel and use the sound of the wheel and the Doppler shift of the sound of the wheel to find out when. And I went to the another casino and I uh, tried to record it. So Larry put a microphone in his hand, a wire to a recorder inside his jacket, and wrapped his arm as if he had a broken arm. And he put his arm next to the wheel. And I was a decoy. I was there gambling and drawing, drawing attention to me. And Kleinrock sat there betting on the side. Well, he started winning. And the pit boss came by as he started seeing him winning and me, my bandaged hand near the wheel. And he said, now, what's wrong with your hand? And I said, well, I burned it. <laughs> and now the croupier started noticing me, and he saw Larry and me walking together. So I'm winning. I'm a buddy with Larry, and Larry's hand is right next to the wheel, wrapped up like a mummy. So this croupier takes Larry's broken arm, and he yanks it. And he said, well, we'd like it. would you like it broken off? And so at that point, we decided we'd better leave. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, we let all our passengers drive the dock. You out do? The open water, sure. Let's get back to New England, true birthplace of the information age. Not only is this the home of Captain Bubblehead and his amphibious assault craft, but in the 60s it was the hub of advanced computer research. Massachusetts is famous for much more than just the Boston Tea Party, which happened over there in Boston Harbor. It's also renowned for Boston's twin city across the river, Cambridge, home of two of the most high-powered scientific institutions in the world. But beyond Harvard and MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, there's another outfit often called the third university on the Charles. It's a high-tech engineering company called BBNN for its founders, Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. In 1968, BBN was ready to take its place in networking history. So let's meet some of the team who would unexpectedly change the world. Californian Dave Walden made juggling the hobby of choice around the ARPANET community. Frank Hart was a systems engineer from Yonkers with a reputation as a tough manager. Severo Ornstein, musician and rock climber, later founded Computer Scientists for Social Responsibility. This outfit was ready for the challenge issued from the Pentagon. BBN was aware for uh, some time before that that a bid was, uh, a request for a proposal was coming. Bob Kahn, in particular, who was one of our team, was aware of that. BBN put together a team of people to get ready to bid. So, in fact, we were working on the bid before the request for proposal came out. Uh, planning, thinking, doing designs. So, when the actual request for proposal came out, in some sense, it was like doing the design a second time. It seemed we could build it, and I went in and told Frank, in words which I guess have become somewhat immortalized, that uh, sure, we could build it, but I had no idea why anybody would want such a thing. Christmas 1968. The Apollo 8 astronauts became the first men to orbit the moon. God said, let the waters of the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And God saw that it was and from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. And BBN got their own Christmas message from ARPA. They'd won the bid. Now they would have the chance to start wiring the planet. First, they had to turn a theory into a practical network. Len Kleinrock at UCLA was the guy with the theory. My PhD dissertation basically uncovered the underlying principles of packet switching, of message switching, of burst communications, of data networking. Here's another word from the cringely glossary of geek. Packet. And since this is the very foundation stone of the internet, please pay attention. We have two computers, and they are connected to each other by a digital network. We want to send a message from one computer to the other. Do we send it as one big chunk or lots of little chunks? Well, it's much easier to put sand on a pipe than boulders, so I say little chunks. These chunks are called packets. And the first thing we do is we number them so we know their order in case they get out of sequence going over the network. 
and we add some extra information to them that says where they came from and where they're going. So that if, for example, there's a traffic jam along here, the network can redirect them through another computer. That's called packet switching. This is how the internet works. Of course, there's no guarantee that the person on this end is actually going to read it. The packet switching network planned by ARPA used phone lines, but in a way that never been used before. When you make a phone call to your, to your mother-in-law and then talk to her on that phone line, whether you talk fast or slow or halt in the middle, uh, you tie up the phone line the whole time. Computers tend to talk in little bursts when they talk to each other. So there was a lot of technology that had never been done in trying to, to break up messages into packets and send them over phone lines. Vint Cerf was at UCLA. Bob Kahn was at BBN. Two more pioneers who helped design the ARPANET. They're not exactly household names, but they should be, as we'll be hearing later. There is a, an electrical linkage, an electromagnetic linkage, between your telephone and the other one, which stays up, fully connected, until the conversation is over and one of you hangs up. It would be the equivalent of, in order to drive from, let's say, Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, having to reserve the whole road, you know, for you to make the, the trip, and it's not a very efficient use of the road space. To build a network linking mainframe computers over telephone lines, in the 1960s there were two monster companies you'd expect to be involved. But both AT&T and IBM declined to bid. When I asked AT&T to participate in the ARPANET, they assured me that packet switching wouldn't work. So, um, so that didn't go very far. The telephony attitude. Um, I hope my phone doesn't get cut off. The telephony <laughs> attitude. Uh, is not very compatible with packet switching. What is the telephony attitude? Well, the telephony attitude is we're going to guarantee certain capacities. It's, it's, it's about guaranteed levels of service. It's about investments that, uh, that you make, that you get back over decades. Um, and the world is simply moving much faster than that. The difference between a person talking on a phone line and a computer sending bursts of data is simple. Computers do it quickly and more efficiently. Sorry, Mom. Packets are just like postcards. You know, they've got to and from addresses, and they have a finite amount of, of content on them. And like a postcard, you, know, you put it into the post box. If you put two in, you don't know what order they're going to come out. They might not even come out on the same day. Uh, some of them get lost. That's true of packets. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't necessarily follow the same paths to get to the destination. That's also true of, of electronic packets. The only difference is an electronic packet goes about 100 million times faster than a postcard. So while NASA was sending men into space, the team at BBN was shipping packets down phone lines. Basically, I knew nothing. I would also say that most of us on the team didn't know anything about packet switching because, in fact, we were inventing packet switching. There were a lot of very difficult, detailed technical problems. But I don't, breakthrough would not be how I would describe any of that. I, you know, I tend to think of breakthroughs as inventing DNA or uh, something else. And there was none of that, really. Yeah. I think, actually, God invented DNA. <laughs> <laughs> and I think none of us had any doubt that we could do it in, in nine months. It was an engineering task. It was a fun one. Yes, we were going to have to work day and night and weekends, but not so hard. By an odd coincidence, the ARPA-funded scientists designed the blueprint, wrote the software, and built the computers for the world's first digital network, just as NASA's Apollo program reached its lunar climax. Two visions of science and technology, one begun in 1958 and the other in 1961, would both deliver the goods within a few weeks. Kind of neat, isn't it? I wonder what became of the space program. Come here, I want to show you something. It's right over here. This is a historic machine. It's the first IMP on the ARPANET. IMP stands for Interface Message Processor. Today, we'd call it a router. Back then, it was a mini computer that was connected to one or several mainframes here at UCLA and made possible packet switching. 
The packets would come in, the imp would sort them out, error correct them, and either send them to those local machines or later when there were more imps, send them across the ARPANET. Oh, you can tell this thing was built for the military. It's built like a tank. And for the first 7,792 hours of the ARPANET, it made sure that we got a message instead of a mess. After just nine months' work, the moment of truth. The first imp was ready to be blitzed with bits. On budget, on time, this was a government project? My laboratory was the place where the internet came to life. It was then called the ARPANET. We, were the we had the first switch, which was called an IMP, an interface message processor. It was wheeled into my laboratory over the Labor Day weekend in 1969. And on Tuesday of that next week, we had bits moving back and forth between that switch and my host computer. Len Kleinrock was so moved by his historic role that 30 years later he wrote a poem to recall the romance of imps, nodes, and technical specifications that only geeks could love or rhyme. It was back in 67 that the clan agreed to meet. The gangsters and the planners were a breed damned hard to beat. The goal we set was honest and the need was clear to all. Connect those big old mainframes and the minis lest they fall. BBNN delivered the product on time, 1st of September, actually a little earlier than the guys at UCLA hoped. Our software wasn't quite ready when the hardware showed up. and we, It was Labor Day weekend and we were sort of hoping that <laughs> It might be delayed, they airshipped it. BBN had promised that the imp was running late. We welcomed any slippage in the deadly scheduled date. But one day after Labor Day, it was plopped down at our gate. Those dirty, rotten scoundrels sent the damn thing out air freight. Battleship gray cabinet with eye hooks in the top so that a helicopter could lift it. And it was a refrigerator-sized object with a computer in it, a Honeywell 516, and with special interfaces that had been designed by Owen Stein. Uh, built by Honeywell in that cabinet so that it would then connect to host computers at each site. And inside was a program which had been written at BBN. So, so <laughs> the machine shows up, they get it on a forklift, and it goes into the UCLA facility, and they turn it on, and it picks up where it left off. You see, the government sometimes picks dates for the hell of it. I mean, there was no reason. If, to be truth known, uh, it was an artificial date picked by the government and picked by Larry Roberts. I don't know how the devil they picked it. As I recall that Tuesday, it makes me want to cry. Everybody's brother came to blame the other guy. Folks were there from ARPA, BBN, and Honeywell, UCLA, and ATT, and all were scared as hell. We cautiously connected, and the bits began to flow. The pieces really functioned, just why I still don't know. Messages were moving pretty well by Wednesday morn. All the rest is history. Packet switching had been born. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Uh, Seven man, weeks before the ARPANET sparked to life, Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Time will tell whether Apollo or ARPANET meant more for mankind, but there's no argument who had the better sound bite. A month later, a second imp was ready at Stanford. What memorable message was sent? All we tried to do was log on from our host to their host. You know, let's see, remember, we're engineers, okay? So I had one of my guys set this up, and we also had a voice line in parallel with the data line. So he had a pair of headphones and a speaker, and so did the other guy at the other end. And so we typed in L. And we said, did you get the L? And he said, I got the L. So you want to type in L-O-G, and then the rest would be L-O-G-I, and it would span out the word login. You got the L. Hit the L. Did you get the O? Got the L. Did you get the G? Crash. <laughs> the system failed on the G. And a couple of hours later, we successfully logged in, did some minimal things, and logged off. That was the first message on the internet. Login, crash. <laughs> <laughs> The ARPANET was born at a tumultuous time on campus. You were more likely to meet hippies than hackers. Some hippies were hackers, too, and thought computers could be used to change society. Stuart Brand was one. He founded the Whole Earth Catalog, Bible of the 70s Alternative Lifestyle. It had a great impact on the first generation to use the Internet. Hackers succeeded and hippies failed. <laughs> 
Uh, same group of people, same length of hair, um, only instead of drugs it was computers. And I think the main difference there is that drugs never got any better and computers just kept getting better and better and better. And uh, the kind of money you could make with drugs was problematic and the kind of money you could make with computers was fabulous. Ted Nelson was another visionary who grasped the potential of computer networking in his book Computer Lib long before it was technically feasible. It's not that I claim to be smarter than other people, it's just that most technical people don't understand the creative process, don't understand the problems of ideas and of evolving ideas and of the representation of ideas and the, represent, the evolving representation of evolving ideas and the intercomparison of the evolving representation of evolving ideas. And that's the issue. Nothing less will do. Howard Rheingold, a whole earth catalog writer and career high-tech hipster, believed computers could become tools of liberation. It's not so much anti-establishment as empowerment of the individual. The belief that if you can give people tools, they can do things. They can make the new, better society. And that uh, joining some crusade to create some great cause has, has failed. In 1972, I wrote an article for Rolling Stone called Fanatic Life and Symbolic Death Among the Computer Bums. And the opening line was, ready or not, computers are coming to the people. And it was pretty much uh, you know, foretelling what came to pass, which was that uh, computers had been liberated from the IBM mainframe approach to life. The idea that computers could really be used for extending our intellects and communicating with each other was something that didn't emerge for a while. That's how it started, is, is you know, turning a mainframe into a personal computer. And then they just found various ways, first with time sharing and then with actually making these things to make personal computers. The idea was power to the people, mm -hmm. straight out of the you know, straight 60s doctrine. Advances in computer networking weren't limited to the mainland. Scientific experiments in Hawaii couldn't be easily connected by phone lines. The solution was to use radio. So was it the engineering challenge that drew Norm Abramson to Hawaii? Actually, it was the surf. I was teaching out here, actually, at Stanford when I first saw Hawaii um, about uh, 30 years ago, and 29 years ago, I decided to move there. Uh, it took me about a year to find a university position there and move to Hawaii to go surfing. I don't know much about the University of Hawaii, but it doesn't just jump to mind as a hotbed of computer research. It isn't, but the surf is a hell of a lot better than it is here. <laughs> we convinced uh, Larry in particular that uh, we could do something that had never been done before technically. And this was what, the Aloha Net? It was the Aloha Net. It was the first network that decided uh, yeah. that it was sensible to transmit data into a computer by means of radio waves rather than uh, telephone lines or, or conventional wires. And we put a, a radio channel together, connected it in a, in a new way to a computer, a, a very primitive computer at that time, and demonstrated uh, wireless data for the first time in and out of a computer. And, and you were doing wireless data in Hawaii because of their islands, is that it? Frankly, I was doing it because of the surf. By 1970, packet switching networks were running on phone lines, radio, and satellite over long distances on land and across the oceans. It was, theoretically, international. By 1972, the ARPANET had grown to include 20 locations, including MIT. The pioneers from BBN settled down to managing and extending the network. But still, hardly anyone knew about it. So Larry Roberts at the Pentagon decided it was time to let the world know that ARPA had invented the future of computing. I had Bob Kahn organize this huge show for us of the network where we had dozens of network terminals and we had an imp on site in the, the uh, hotel in Washington. 
and everybody brought in all their stuff and got their computers online. Basically set up a node on the ARPANET, right on the ballroom, right on the floor of one of the ballrooms. And with a false floor, we wired it up, and we actually got donations of some 40 or 50 computer terminals from different manufacturers, and then we orchestrated uh, with a variety of uh, different uh, research places to put applications up on their system and, and make them work. In Washington, he was log on to a machine at MIT. There, call up a program from UCLA whose job was to execute and run and send the data to a printer right next to him in Washington. So you can imagine, you know, MIT, UCLA, Washington, you know, at those times, moving things around the country was, was really hot. What was the public reaction? I think it varied from the light that we had so many people in one place doing all the stuff and it all worked to astonishment that it was even possible on the part of people who just did not know, weren't exposed to this before. It was a real, real event. It was a kind of a, you know, a, a happening, you know, like happens once in, once in your lifetime. Throughout the 70s, the ARPANET grew. Other networks were created too, but there was a problem. Each network was different with its own rules. You couldn't send packets from one network to another, let alone through another to a third. There was no common language, no common way to communicate, no way to get a program from one to the other. So we basically had a serious problem in transporting anything uh, in, in terms of knowledge. So we had no way to essentially, like language, for civilization to grow. And we were stuck back like the, um, the man before he had language in terms of being able to exchange and build on the past. As far as usage of the network goes, uh, for a while, it was very, very, very underused. I, I, I think it was a little bit like having a, you know, a, a very good highway system and no cars, uh, uh, because there weren't very many programs set up to use it. The, the, the individual universities did not have protocols, uh, rules. In other words, when, when you call somebody in France, you could have a perfect connection, but if they don't speak English and you don't speak French, you still don't talk much. So, so even though this network was put in, uh, the hosts couldn't talk to each other in many cases about very much. TCPIP. These are probably the five most important letters of the information revolution. They stand for Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. What a mouthful. In the Glossary of Geek, a protocol is the rules that control how different computers talk to each other. The TCPIP protocol was invented by Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn. It determines how computer networks talk to each other. Without TCP IP, there would be no internet. What an achievement, and yet such a name. They could have named it WOW or KISS, but TCP IP? Bob and Vint decided to work together to crack the problem. On one of his visits to the Bay Area, Bob stopped in to see me at Stanford and was describing for me these other packet switching networks that he was developing and pointed out that he knew that he needed to find a way of interconnecting them. If BBNN had one network and let's say AT&T had another, it would have been possible to just plug the two together with a box in the middle and BBNN and AT&T wouldn't have had to do anything to make that work other than agree to let their networks be plugged in. And so we began to think about uh, the question of protocols that would allow such an amal amalgam of networks to interwork. We did that work in the early 70s, and that was before the Ethernet was on the scene. It was before the personal computer and workstation. So, I mean, what we did anticipated all that, and by virtue of the niceness of the architecture, the modularity of the architecture, it allowed for any network to fit in there, and any computers, including the local area nets of today. Their seminal paper was published in May 1974. They called it a protocol for packet network intercommunication. It's a real page turner. Every new information technology needs something that makes people just have to buy it. It's called the killer application or killer app. For the IBM PC, it was a spreadsheet. For the Macintosh, it was desktop publishing. And the internet is no exception. This is a communication network, so guess what? The killer app is a way of communicating, email. And that's how the lowly at sign jumped from the keyboard into a place of honor in computer history.
Electronic mail was also invented at BBN back in 1972. A program for sending files was adapted to carry a mail message between two mini-computers. Ray Tomlinson is modest about his invention. It was just a hack. And um, the, the next step was to get other people to try using it, because so far I'd only sent mail to myself first and then to the other people in my group. Ray's hack has driven networking for a generation. One of the first applications we put on the system was from Ray Tomlinson's network email. As soon as email came on, it took over the network. But it was hard to believe that that was going to be a major use of the network. It really was. That was not what had been touted in the first place, that sending messages back and forth from uh, people from person to person was going to be a large use of the network. Uh, it was hard to believe for a long time. People to people communications was what excited people. You know, machine to machine or human to machine was not all that exciting. And where did that icon of the internet, the little at sign, come from? Credit Ray for that one, too. I looked at my keyboard on a Model 33 teletype. The one that was most obvious was the at sign, because this, this person was at this other computer. In some sense, he was at it. Um, he was in the same room with it, anyway. And um, so it seemed fairly obvious, and I just chose it. But with email, you know, you could communicate with a lot of people very, very quickly. Sometimes in the middle of the night, it made it possible to start to move things around that uh, you wouldn't have thought about, uh, dealing with people in different time zones. And so it, it really caught on quite a, quite a bit. So you're the guy who invented the use of the at sign in, in email addresses. So yes. I'm Bob at Cringely.com. Mm -hmm. So I can thank you. Well, thanks a lot. A lot of people have said that, <laughs> especially, the one, especially with the advent of junk mail. And, and of course, you, you, you now have infinite wealth. No. No? <laughs> no. And how does it feel to have changed the world? Oh, it feels wonderful. I think, I think it's uh, incredibly exciting. I think that uh, uh, it's, it's the kind of thing where now you go down the street to your neighbors who never knew what a computer was in the days you were doing this, and they're all of a sudden experts at using the web and uh, think that's a lot of fun. So no, it's, it's, it's quite nice. Technologically speaking, the 60s hit two home runs, Man on the Moon and the first computer network. But the funny thing is that none of those pioneers got rich, though at least the astronauts made it on primetime television. As for the geeks who invented the ARPANET, who laid the foundations for the information age, zilch neither fame nor fortune. It took the invention of the PC before someone hit the jackpot, and what a jackpot it was. But that's for the next part of our story.